Okay, welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton Worldwide for everybody worldwide. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Motohiro Yogo with us from Princeton. Hi, Moto. Marques. It's great to have you with us and uh, you're presenting some joint work with Natalie Cox and Andrew Witten. It's titled Financial Inclusion Across the United States. So we're looking forward to learn more about financial inclusion in particular in the light of fintech and other developments and um, how racial divide and other aspects can be better understood in the financial inclusion world. Before I pass on the floor to you, uh, let me just give a few opening remarks. Um, the first one, I would like to connect financial inclusion to resilience. And you know, if you have better financial inclusion, you might be better to bounce back after you face a shock. And how can you include people better? You can once they can save better, so they have a better saving tools. So that helps them ex ante to prepare for some shocks and be more resilient down the road. Or they can also prepare and be able to be better insured. So they get some compensation after facing a negative shock. That also gives them some flexibility to bounce back and not be trapped in some traps or going downward spirals and all this. So all of this uh, financial inclusion helps. And it might also be related to the resilience inequality I was uh, pointing out uh, in my book and earlier. If you have different people, some are able to bounce back and others are not able to bounce back, even though they have the same income and same wealth, uh, the former which are able to bounce back, they are actually have a higher resilience and hence they can take on more risk, they can earn some risk premia, they can take chances and opportunities others can't, and that might down the road lead to some wealth inequality. So resilience inequality is also very important and hopefully financial inclusion will reduce this resilience uh, inequality. The other aspect I would like to raise in terms of fintech, how does financial inclusion look today and how does it look in the future? So fintech might help us to in improve financial inclusion. That's because today the marginal cost of providing these financial services through these new technologies are much lower. So that's essentially the good aspect. But let's also look a little bit into the future. So financial inclusion might become essential or necessary. So imagine today the internet essentially, people say it's a human right to have internet or electricity is a human right to have electricity. Perhaps in the future, it will be a human right to have financial inclusion because we can essentially not live without financial services. So the power to not to be included is actually the punishment is much more severe. So and that gives actually the fintech companies also some power to exclude. If you throw somebody out, you can punish somebody. So imagine these days you can always fall back on cash, but if there's no cash anymore, we do everything with online payment and suddenly the platforms kick you out the exclusion power is way more powerful once you have financial inclusion we all got used to it and i would like to understand this as well of course you could argue these platforms have a better enforcement technology they can enforce debt contracts because they can exclude people and punish them severely but the question is do we want that and so who sh how should we regulate this to make sure that financial inclusion by some fintech companies doesn't become too powerful and is still in the private interest uh, even for poor people. So that's essentially another issue I would like to, to raise. You know, who is deciding this? Is private firms deciding it, whether you can exclude somebody from services or not? And then I would like to come to the questions. Uh, Moto uh, raised uh, some poll questions, and I'm curious to see your answers. And here are the answers. So the first question is, um, do you know an American adult who does not have a bank account? And the question uh, was answered. This 13% said, yes, they know somebody. But the majority, 87%, don't know anybody who has, has an auto bank account. Do you know anybody who doesn't have a retirement account? That's much more 50-50. So 54% know somebody. And 46% uh, don't know anybody. The third question was, what do you think is the most important factor in the geographical difference which determines you know, whether uh, financial participation occurs or not. Is it race? That's what 16% uh, uh, said. Is it income? 62% said income is the most important factor. And access to banks and other financial services, 20%, and other factors, only 2%. And finally, the fourth question was, should actually the government require, state or federal government, 
to offer that employers have to offer some retirement accounts to their employees. And over a third strongly agree with that. And another third agree with that. So it's two thirds essentially have agree or strongly agree. 20%, 21% are neutral, 8% disagree, and almost nobody strongly disagrees, only 3% strongly disagree. So with these answers, I give the floor to Moto, who will enlighten us what he has learned from looking through some fantastic data about financial inclusion in the United States across and what are the driving factors, whether you know people are included or excluded, and that they can be part of the financial services uh, the industry is providing. Thanks again, Moto. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Marcus, for this opportunity to present um, my work with joint with Andrew Witten, who's at the US Treasury Department and my colleague at Princeton, Natalie Cox. So um, kind of the starting point for this project is um, kind of the ideal that in an inclusive society, everyone should have access to uh, financial services, in particular, banking and retirement accounts, regardless of uh, your income or race. And we kind of know from household surveys that um, income and race are important uh, determinants of financial participation. Um, as wonderful as household surveys are, they do have some limitations. Uh, one is that they're typically small samples. Um, they have a limited panel dimension. For example, the survey of consumer finances, um, we observe cross sections of households that are not necessarily linked over time. And then the third is a uh, potential measurement error that comes with survey data. So um, in this project, we use big data um, from um, essentially all the tax records for US households. And we focus on age 50 to 59, which is kind of the critical part of your life cycle where um, households are starting to save about, save, think about savings for retirement. And we covered the sample uh, from 2008 to 2018. And what the big data allows us to do is uh, do de detailed geographic analysis that would not be possible with um, survey data that are smaller samples. So we can really look very closely at the geographic um, zip code level to see how financial participation correlates with things like income race or access to financial or banking services. And then the second thing we can do is we can evaluate uh, recent state laws that require employers to offer a retirement plan. And I'll be uh, talking more about that a little later. Okay, so the administrative tax data, um, we actually have data since 1999 through 2018. So 1999 is the first year in which the tax data were digitized. So, okay, that's, so that's our starting point. And most of you know about Form 1040. Those are the annual tax returns that you file. Um, but in addition, you might get these forms from your employer such as a W-2 for wages, a 1099 int, which reports interest income from a financial institution, a 1099 div, uh, dividend, a 1099 R, which are um, uh, retirement accounts and so on. Okay, so these information returns allow us to cover a population that's much wider than the population that's actually filing taxes. Okay, so even if you don't file taxes, you might actually receive a W-2 or SSA 1099 from the Social Security Administration. So by um, these information returns together with tax returns, we can cover um, almost the entire US population. So we get a coverage rate about 96% relative to the population census. And we can tell which um, individuals are married through joint tax filing, or even if you don't file taxes together this particular year, you can, we can observe that you filed in the past together and that you live in the same address. Okay, so through those, data, uh, through those information, we can uh, link individuals together and form households. Okay, and our measure of income um, in the data is we observe um, a five-year history of your income. We take an average and we call that usual income. So, okay, so this five-year averaging allows us to kind of say what your usual level of income is that smoothes over um, like bonuses or fluctuations that are um, only temporary. 
So Moto can ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the unbanked people in the US, they're, you know, some of them are illegally here or they're, they're in hiding. So does your data capture them too? Or is essentially only the guys who file taxes, but if I'm illegally here, do I have to file taxes? Or do I file taxes or not? Oh, so just to be clear, um, the information returns go out to people who don't even file taxes, mm -hmm. right? So if you work for an employer and earn wages, I get a W-2. Now, whether I file a tax return is my decision, and, and lots of individuals choose not to file, even though they receive a W-2, because their income is below the threshold for paying taxes. Now, um, some, some of these individuals sh maybe should have filed taxes to receive a refund, but um, not everyone does file taxes. So we, our coverage is much wider than just tax filers for that reason. And then uh, the other um, part of your question is uh, what happens with people, for example, who don't have social security numbers? Yes. Uh, those are also in our data and they're uh, assigned in the data, uh, these identifiers, uh, that allows us to uh, identify um, who they are, but they don't necessarily have to have a social security number. Now, what, what they do have to have is that they have to be issued one of these forms. Okay, so um, again, it, it might be issued a W-2 or a 1099 miscellaneous for miscellaneous income. Um, and these are forms that you could receive even without a social security number. Okay, so that's why our- Do you have any idea what fraction of the population living in the US is not cover, covered? Is it 1% or is it tiny? So, oh, oh, so 4% relative. Oh, these are the four. Okay. okay. Yeah, so we're missing 4%. Now, um, I should mention that we're in actually in the process of uh, improving the coverage further. Mm -hmm. So, we recently discovered that um, some people don't receive any of these information forms that I mentioned, but they do receive something like a 1095, which is the new information return that came along with the Affordable Care Act, which tells you like whether you're covered by Medicaid, for instance. So it turns out that once we include those, we're gonna get much closer to 100. I think we can get essentially 100%. Um, so, but that's that's kind of in, in uh, current underworks right now and we, we haven't implemented that yet. Okay. Um, so, how we measure bank account participation is uh, based on uh, the 1040, the tax returns. So if you receive a refund or make a tax payment using electronic funds transfer, then that re gets recorded in our data and we observe that you have a bank account. Uh, the 1099 int uh, also tells us whether uh, you've received interest income. Now, the problem with 1099 int is there's a minimum threshold. You have to earn interest income at least $10 for the financial institution to be required to file a 1099 int on your behalf. So uh, this doesn't, isn't always a reliable source of information for whether you have a bank account. Okay. Um, for retirement accounts, uh, the measurement is, I would say, even better in, in the following sense. So all of us who receive a W-2, there's a checkbox on W-2 that, that says whether you um, participated in an employer retirement plan. And that includes both defined benefit plans as well as defined contribution plans. A 1099-R is a distribution from a retirement account. So that includes both employer accounts as well as it includes uh, IRAs, uh, in individual retirement arrangements. And then the 5498 is uh, a form that gets issued um, for contributions into an IRA. Okay, so by combining these information returns, we basically observe every um, retirement account transaction, including defined benefit plans, defined contribution plans, as well as IRAs. Now, in addition, um, we also want to measure whether um, you have access to a retirement plan through your employer. Okay, so not all of us whose employer offers us a plan would necessarily decide to opt in. Some people decide to opt out. Okay, so we wanna see whether um, people are opting in or opting out. And the way we can measure that is again, based on W-2s. Okay, so I observe um, all the W-2s, right? So I can tell whether uh, for a given employer, so EIN sensor employer identifier number. So for a given employer, I can see whether the checkbox on the W-2 is checked to see if anyone at, at this firm um, has a retirement account, right? So from that, I can tell whether 
the employees in that um, uh, employer are, are eligible um, or potentially eligible for, for contributing to a retirement plan. Now for each of these measures, uh, we look at the panel dimension. So we have a 10 year history of whether you've ever received a refund or tax payment in the past, or whether you've ever participated in an entire retire employer retirement plan from your history of W-2s. So uh, once we considered uh, that fact that we need a 10 year history to, to measure these variables, we end up with our final sample of 2008 to 2018. Okay, so one thing we were concerned about is maybe um, because the because, tax so data- So you threw away mm -hmm. some data because earlier you said you're from 1999 onwards. Now you only started 2008, is this correct? Or? Yes, because uh, the 2008 um, observation that I have is based on the history from 1999 to 2008. Oh, okay. okay. So for each year, uh, I have a 10 year look back period. Okay, fair enough. So okay. Then, Thanks. Yeah, so that's 2008's earliest year in which I have a full 10 year history to measure my variables. Um, so um, one thing we were worried about is because um, the tax returns are kind of a flow based measure, right? That's like whether you contributed to a retirement account this year or whether you filed taxes this year uh, using electronic funds transfer, um, there's a potential uh, risk that we undermeasure participation, right? Because you could be in a situation where you have a bank account, but you happen to not file taxes this year. Okay, so one way to kind of assess whether we're like severely undermeasuring financial participation is uh, we can uh, take the average of um, financial participation in our data. So in 2016, uh, households at the lowest income quintile, so this is the lo lowest 20th percentile of income, 82% uh, of those households um, actually had a bank account according to our measurement. Now, um, if we're under measuring this, then this should be lower than what it is in the survey of consumer finances, which is actually 76%. So if anything, we're actually like uh, getting a higher estimate of uh, financial participation than the, than the SCF. Now, if you look at the highest income groups, okay, so households in the highest income quintile between 80 and 100%, then 100% of those households have a bank account regardless of whether you're measured in the SCF or in the tax data. Okay, so kind of the measurement at the top is, is not affected um, by which data you use, but the measurement at the bottom seems um, somewhat sensitive to, to which source you're looking at, whether the tax data or the SCF. Okay? And we're so digging what more. does the SCF data have? The administrative tax data doesn't. In a sense, you said it almost has 96% of the population, no? Yeah. So there's two, two hypotheses. One is that the remaining 4% that we don't measure mm -hmm. might be all non-participants. And that would uh, reconcile this gap. And so that we're trying to close in on that hypothesis by trying to get closer to 100%. But, but the other one is um, SCF is not um, a perfect sample either, right? So um, it is a survey. It does require people to you know, answer the survey and answer them accurately and so on. So kind of the, um, the way in which economics um, research is proceeding these days is um, survey data are still very useful and, and we still use them, but the administrative data gives us like an additional measurement where sometimes we discover that um, things that we thought were facts in the survey data are, are no longer true when we measure, try so to the measure survey, them. The survey of consumer finances, are they zooming in on the very poor ones or they're just, and what- It's, it's only supposed to be a, a um, representative sample of the US. Okay. So in, in, in theory, we're trying to measure the same thing. In practice, it's not exactly the same. So the standard errors on this 76% could be quite high in a sense. Uh, so I computed the standard errors. The standard errors are no more than 1%. Okay. So 76 plus or minus 1% uh, is the standard error. So it's mm -hmm. like very, it's pretty tight actually. So the standard errors wouldn't be able to explain the differences entirely. How many people are involved in this survey? Um, around, uh, uh, let's see, around uh, 7,000. 7, okay. In, in our age group, 50 to 59. 
and, and in your tax data, there are millions, no? Yeah, in my tax data, I have um, six, oh, sorry, I want to say uh, six, over six million. It's more like seven million. Yeah, because I literally measure every single person in that age group, yeah. Okay, so in terms of retirement account participation, um, these numbers are actually um, um, are 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 uh, pretty surprising in in some sense. So so one thing that's not surprising is if you look in the highest income group, so eighty to one hundred percentile, uh, essentially ninety nine percent have a retirement account. Okay, so retirement account participation is not a problem for, for the wealthy, right? They, they find a way to participate. But even kind of middle income um, participation is still pretty good as I'm circling here. 98%, uh, 97% uh, in 2016, in the 60 to 80 income group, uh, still 91% in the 40 to 60 income group. But then it kind of like drops off. So among the lowest income group, uh, it's only 42%. Okay, so this is like what I mean by financial inclusion is uh, why, why is it 42%? Why is it not higher? Is there anything that society can do to make this 42% higher? I think those are the kind of questions we're well, interested in. What's puzzling in. to me is that the SCF, the Survey of Consumer Finance, is always lower than the tax data for any infant. Is yeah. This... So um, this predates our study. But some people have also looked at uh, the difference between the administrative tax data mm -hmm. and the census survey data. Mm -hmm. And what they always find is survey data systematically seem to underreport retirement account participation relative also to Also, people tax don't data. want to report that they have a retirement account. So it's either they don't want to report or they forget that they have one. Mm -hmm. So suppose like you're not a consistent contributor or you mm -hmm. switch jobs in the last 10 years. You might've contributed five years ago at your previous job, but you, 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 you forgot to report it in a survey. Or if but you have a defined- this, Sorry. If you have a it's defined the, benefit plan, it might be even worse mm -hmm. because if you have a defined benefit plan, you're technically, right, have a retirement account, but you're not contributing it to it actively. So you might not even remember, realize that you have one. Okay. So I should trust your data more. Uh, yes, subject to some um, caveats, but yeah, yes. we're, we're trying to literally measure every single person. So that's kind of the spirit of the exercise. Um, one thing that's interesting is like, how, how are people participating in retirement accounts? So the, the key number is in the lowest income group, 42% uh, participate, right? But then is it through employers? Um, IRAs or both. So 25% only have a retire, uh, employer plan, 6% uh, have only an IRA and 11% have both. Okay, so predominantly among the lowest income group, right, the way in which they participate is not by going to Fidelity and opening up your own IRA, um, they're having have a retirement account through their employers. Okay, so the combination of 25 and 11, uh, that's 36 uh, out of 42. Yeah, most of them do participate through employers. Now, if we go to like the highest income individuals uh, or households, these are 99% of households in the highest income group um, participate. Among those households, 76% um, have both. So kind of predominantly uh, wealthy people find a way to participate not only through their employer plans, but also through IRAs. Now I should um, uh, add a caveat here that um, having an IRA doesn't necessarily mean that um, you contributed directly to an IRA. If you have um, an employer account and you quit your job, you can roll over your employer, employer plan to an IRA. Okay, so some of these guys have um, uh, an IRA, not because they contributed directly to an IRA, but it's potentially through through their employer plans that they roll over. So Moto, there's some questions from Tom. Uh, he would like to know, does the IRS knock out data that would enable you to identify specific taxpayers? And that might lead to some change in percentages. Uh, 
What do you mean by specific taxpayers? I'm not sure if, if I If you could identify a particular person, a taxpayer, that would remove them from your data set. Probably no, because your percentage points would still. Wait, what, so what do you mean by remove? Sorry, I'm still not. Sorry. Because they want to make sure that you cannot identify somebody. I guess they only remove really very wealthy guys from your tax data. Oh, okay, okay. Now I understand the question. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so first, uh, um, the, the data are um, anonymized in the way that uh, right, the identifiers are not actual social security numbers. So they assign. Um, kind of pseudo identifiers that don't allow me to identify people. And then the second one, this is kind of critical and this the, the most important part is um, I'm not using dollar amounts of contributions. Um, I'm using one or zero of whether they have an account or not. And that actually allowed us to do this study because if I were using uh, actual data on dollar amounts, that would obviously be more sensitive because that might allow me to identify very wealthy individuals. So essentially, if I open an IRA account and put hundred dollars in, and I forget about it for the next thirty years, it is I always have an IRA account. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And in fact, um, in your example that you just said, um, the institution where you have an IRA mm -hmm. account would continue to issue these fifty four ninety eight. So. Um, so I would observe you, yeah, um, in the in our data. Okay, so um, one of the kind of the facts that popped out of our study, which is kind of interesting, is uh, what what's happening to financial participation over time. So like our kind of prior before looking at the data was, well, things have to improve over time, right? Um, so that turns out to be not so true. So what this figure is showing is that um, if you're in the highest income group, okay, uh, they're always participating uh, one, right? And then if you're lower income, well, uh, you're nearly almost uh, always participating, uh, but there's no like um, meaningful trends in the data. Now, if you look at the lowest income group, then among these households, the participation rate in 2008 was 85%. And this gradually declines over time to 79% in 2018. Now at each year, what I'm looking at is the participation rate among 50 to 59 year olds. Right? So what this is saying is like 50 to 59 year olds in 2008 participated more than 50 to 59 year olds in 2018. So these are essentially what we call cohort effects, right? Each younger cohorts of households are participating with less frequency over time. Um, you can do the same thing with retirement accounts where the trends are not only visible among the lowest income, but even the second lowest income group. Uh, among the lowest income group, the participation rate in 2008 was 49% and it's declined to 41% in 2018. Now, I think the um, the one for banking was more surprising to me. Uh, the one for retirement accounts was less surprising to me for the following reason, which is there are all these narratives going on that um, the types of jobs people have these days are not um, as secure as they used to be. So like temporary workers, gig workers, and so on, they might not have the um, type of employment arrangement that allows them to qualify for a retirement uh, account through their employer. And moreover, we know that the secular trend um, in the economy is that uh, private, both private and government pension plans are disappearing over time. Uh, private pension plans, because firms are no longer interested in bearing the risk of a defined benefit plan. Um, and then governments, because of um, pressures to their uh, fiscal capacity and so on. And so th those kind of like very um, important trends in the economy could, could very well translate into these patterns of a declining um, access to uh, retirement accounts. And, and then panel C makes this point more clearly, which is panel, what panel C shows is not whether you participate in an account, but whether you have, have had access to an employer retirement plan in the last 10 years. So in 2008, 60% um, of households in the lowest income quintile had access to uh, retirement plans, 
but not that number has declined to 50% in 2018. So it's actually declining at a rate of about one percentage point per year. So this is the sense in which um, there, there's a policy um, intervention potentially, which is, can we stop this trend from like keep going down, going, going down and can we reverse this trend, maybe increase access to retirement plans? And as I'll, I'll discuss later in my presentation, that's kind of the spirit of the state laws that have been passed across uh, 10 states now that essentially make um, access to retirement plans mandatory for all employers. Okay, so to get um, our feet um, um, warmed up for the, the next part of the paper where we do geographic analysis, I wanted to remind people like what, what do we see in the SCF regarding uh, bank and retirement participation and, and how that correlates with things like income and race. So in um, column one, this is a linear regression of bank account participation, one or zero, on uh, whether you're Hispanic, Black, other non-white, the admitted category being white here, uh, and, um, uh, and, and what this shows is that um, Hispanic households are 14 percentage points less likely to have a bank account than a white household. Uh, black households are 13 percentage points less likely to have a bank account. Uh, if we control for income here, right, income is a very important determinant of uh, financial participation, but bank account participation still correlates with uh, whether um, the household's Hispanic or black okay, by nine percentage points difference. So what this is saying is um, income is important, but doesn't seem to explain away the correlation between financial participation and race. And then same thing with retirement accounts. So Hispanic households are 33 percentage points less likely to have a retirement account, black households 22 relative to white households. And um, if we control for income in column four, these numbers uh, decline a little bit, but it's still 21 percentage point difference between Hispanics and whites and uh, nine percentage points between uh, blacks and whites. So, Moto, so but can you also make a time trend on that? Is it like the situation for the Hispanics is worse oh, yeah. than for the whites, let's say, but over time the gap is closing or is widening? Oh, that's a good question. Um, this, this data um, that I'm looking at, this is, um, I'm not sure if it's a long enough sample to, to do that. So what I should do is um, go back in the SCF um, and, and, mm -hmm. and test that. Uh, so, so the answer is, uh, I because don't Because if you I look at, know. for example, in life expectancy, you know, the situation, especially for the whites is worsening dramatically yeah. over time. So perhaps you'll find a similar thing here as yeah, well. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so this is just a snapshot in 2016. Yes, okay. Uh, so yeah, so I don't. I'd, I'd have to repeat this regression um, over time to answer your question. So I'm not sure. Okay. So uh, based on this type of analysis, which which is not new to our paper, um, people have kind of looked at these regressions um, over many studies. Um, there is a puzzle in the literature, like why does uh, race seem to matter even if you control for income? Is there something special about race? What is it capturing? Is it evidence for discrimination and, and so on? Okay, those, that's kind of the, the narrative and the questions people are um, pondering about. Okay, okay so given that um, type of fact, uh, we go into our geographic analysis. So what we do is we can um, tabulate participation rates uh, by zip code. So it's not exactly zip code, but they're called zip code uh, tabulation areas. So they're essentially geographic representations of uh, zip codes that are developed by the Census Bureau. And we can link the data to actual population counts and as well as the ratio uh, population shares by zip code. And we can also see the location of bank branches by zip code using the FDIC data. Moto can ask a different question. Yeah. Do you have any way to identify who offers this retirement account? Is it a traditional provider or is it some fintech uh, company? Is there any way to see developments new through fintech improving or worsening things? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because um, our, our bank account participation measure comes primarily from um, tax returns. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I don't think we can tell. Um, but you don't know who, which bank is filing this tax returns. Yeah, um, I have to look into it. So, so there is a um, payment code associated with it, each tax filing, and the question is whether the payment code reveals the identity of the financial institution, uh, and and whether we can use that data to um, identify the identity. So, so the question is whether whether we have that data and whether we can use it. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are two separate questions, and I'm not sure. So I can get back to you on that. Um, yeah. Sorry, um, my slides kind of went blank. So let me just try to uh, get get it back now. Um, so this is uh, the geographic map um, that we created, where red indicates uh, low participation in bank accounts, and then yellow indicates high participation. And uh, the areas are um, zip codes. And, and this is for the zero to 20th uh, percentile in income. So uh, what you see here is it's not like the south is all red and the coast are all yellow. It's, it's kind of like mixed. So based on this kind of analysis um, and for, with, as well as regression analysis, we, we actually figured out that uh, these geographic differences in participation is, um, is very significant, even once you control for um, commuter zones. So commuter zones are representations of uh, uh, counties where uh, counties that feed into uh, the same labor markets, they're uh, called a, a commuting zone. So there's about uh, fewer than a thousand commuting zones in the US. So once we uh, control for commuting zones, we can see that even within commuting zones, there's a lot of geographic variation in, in participation rates. So what that prompted also, us to do. Also, I have a question, John. Mm -hmm. I, I might miss something, but it looks like in areas with higher, higher population density, there's fewer people are banked compared to populations where there is uh, areas where the population density is much lower. Or is this yeah, just this it's just, um, yeah. So that's, that's exactly one of the things I tried is uh, see if, um, participation correlates with the population density. Mm -hmm. It does, but not very strongly. So your, your eyes like um, misleading you in, in okay. thinking that this is really- Because if you look at the states on the West Coast, not California, it looks like it's pretty yellow and not so dark, but it's just because there's nobody living there. Or... Yeah, oh, so, so the shade indicates density too, right? So um, what, what you wanna look for is um, very, um, deep red shades, that means like highly populated, but also uh, low participation. And, and then the point is that that's happening um, all throughout the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like particular to uh, south coasts, commuting zones and so on. It's like, this is like variations happening even within commuting zones is what- so Just to understand, now. the darkness is a population density and the color is, the participation. That's exactly right. But you know, dark orange might be very close to red. So uh, yeah. So um, okay, yeah. So uh, yeah. So what you're looking for is like like a troubled area is something like like a very deep red, right? Because that deep red means like red means low participation. Deep means that it's uh high population, yeah. And then, and then you shouldn't pay attention too much to like um, yellow that's not very, uh, like like these areas, right? Where it's yellow, but it's, these are low populated. Yeah. So, um, so I, th I think the one way to kind of um, summarize this data is to kind of run regressions of zip code level participation on um, measures of um, at the geographic level. So we can look at ratio composition by zip code, um, average income by zip code, and see uh, also whether it correlates with location of, of banks by zip code. Okay, so this is a kind of a big table, but let me go through each column. And, and I think it's going to clarify some of the questions um, you just had. So on the first column, this is like the simplest specification where we run a cross-sectional regression 
of zip code level participation in bank accounts on the fraction of the population that's Hispanic, Black, Asian, other non-white, and the omitted care category again is white. So um, we get about a 27% R square. And you see that these um, uh, coefficients on Hispanic and Black are, are negative and highly statistically significant. Okay, so um, in zip codes where the his, uh, Hispanic population uh, is one percentage point higher, then the participation in bank accounts is one basis point lower. Um, so in column two, what we do is uh, we control for commuting zone fixed effects. So now what this column two is asking is, is this correlation between race and participation at the zip code level due to like differences in like geographic areas that are, are broad or is it like kind of micro variation within local geographic areas? So what the commuting zones do is it says that, well, there's a common level of participation, let's say, in the New York metropolitan area. Okay, so once we control for that, is there any remaining variation in the New York pop metropolitan area that is explained by racial differences? And the answer is yes. So you see that, if anything, the coefficient on Hispanic and Black actually become more negative. So now it's like seven uh, percentage point differences. Okay. Um, so what this prompted us to do is, well, so what you really need to be looking for is there's something like different within the New York metropolitan area where um, right, some, some households are, um, some neighborhoods that are more, more Hispanic or some neighborhoods that are more Black, there's some, some differences in participation rates that's not entirely explained um, by um, these geographic measures. So one um, obvious candidate to us initially was, well, maybe it's that in zip codes where um, Hispanic or Black population shares are higher, uh, those are zip codes where um, bank, banks don't like, don't, don't locate, okay? Uh, so there are fewer bank branches in those areas, and as a consequence, uh, these households do not have access to financial services. And unfortunately, that um, variable seems to do nothing. Um, so it's not really correlated with um, at, at the frequency uh, at which you observe bank branches within a zip code. But it could be very different before all this online banking and after this online banking. So can you separate it over time somehow or? Yeah. Um, we, we run this regression like in 2008 versus 2018, which might not be like enough of a time series mm -hmm. to to tell apart, but it doesn't seem like it's sensitive to, yeah, it's not a time thing. It's it's kind of a cross-sectional. And, and the explanation is that with online banking, the branches don't matter so much anymore, or? Um, so with online banking, um, yeah, what, what could happen is um, that, yeah, the location of actual physical branches shouldn't matter. So, so this coefficient zero might be explained by the fact that if, online banking is, is kind of the predominant way in which people bank now, then it shouldn't matter, right? Uh, mm. so, so you're right that uh, to the extent that online banking is, is important, um, our variable might not be capturing the right thing here. But you cannot run it for your 1999 data or whatever? Uh, we could run it for 2008 and we can see that okay. even in 2008, bank, bank branches didn't matter. So, so that, kind of goes against that hypothesis in a sense that, well, online banking might, might not have been very present back in 2008, and even then you get the same result, yeah. Um, in column four uh, is, is kind of the, the magical variable, which is the average log income in a zip code. So once we control for income, you notice that the coefficient on Hispanic and black goes to zero. So based on this, we conclude that uh, it's not really like, ratio differences across zip codes, it's more like in income differences across zip codes that seems to be explaining the local geographic variation in participation. Okay, and uh, the last column says that, well, um, different zip codes also have different um, costs of living in particular regarding housing. So once we control for the 
average home value by zip code, um, uh, we, we thought we might see some differences, but this didn't seem to matter so much. All right, so um, one, um, one conclusion that, that can come out of this is, is um, it's not really something like innately about race, but um, that all, the, all that variation we see in participation is really about income. But when we say income, um, doesn't, it's not clear like what, what exactly income means. Uh, so the direct effects of income is, is obvious ones. Like if you don't have enough income, uh, you're not going to save. So you have a no, no need for a bank account or a retirement account. Uh, if you have low levels of income, also your account balances, even if you open a bank account, might be low. Now with low balances, you might be incurring lots of banking fees. So that might actually discourage low income households from like maintaining a bank account. And then finally, uh, in regard to retirement accounts, uh, one major way in which we, reason we open retirement accounts is to um, have tax efficient savings. But if you don't pay taxes in the first place, uh, those incentives might not be there. Now that, that doesn't actually work exactly because it's, there's what's called a saver's credit that allows you to claim tax credits on contributions, even if you're a low income household that don't pay taxes. So, so this argument doesn't exactly work, but, but it, I mentioned it just, just as, a, as a possibility. Um, the now, fact that the, income and raise is highly correlated. That, exactly. It's taken care of in a sense or. Yeah, to the multiple regression, we're asking whether, um, even though they're correlated, is it really income mm -hmm. or, or race? Yeah. So we're, we're letting them, the data speak, whether which one's the more important variation, even though they're highly correlated. Um, and then um, other reasons why you get correlation with um, income might be that um, income is associated with uh, financial literacy. So it might be that what we're really finding is not that in, it, it's not only income that matters, but income tends to be correlated with levels of financial literacy that might discourage some low income households from participating. And finally, there could be some uh, peer effects because we're looking at geographic level variation. Okay, so it might be that in kind of um, high income neighborhoods like Princeton, New Jersey, even low income households that live in Princeton are likely to participate because they're likely to bump into uh, households that are um, high income and, and tell you something about retirement accounts. Okay. Um, let me skip over this equation, but then kind of summarize uh, the, the argument that we make, which is um, one reason why we might find differences between SCF, which is at the individual level and the tax data geography level, is that the geographic data are aggregated versions of individuals. So what we're looking at is the sum of what we call individual effects and group effects, okay? Or think of it as potentially peer effects, right? So, um, so what you kind of need to argue is that in order for the differences between the SCF and the tax data um, to be explained by individual versus group effects, you, what you need is that the individual effect, which is that uh, Blacks are less likely to participate has to perfectly offset a group effect, which is that in um, neighborhoods that with a higher black population share, um, white households are more likely to participate. So if that's the case, then those two effects can offset each other in, in a way that we find these zero effects at the zip code level. But what's kind of um, hard to argue, or hard to believe about this argument is that the individual effect and group effects have to exactly off offset each other to get a zero effect, right? So, so it's like a knife edge scenario that seems unlikely. And moreover, it's not really clear why um, white households in, in neighborhoods that are um, with a higher black population share are more likely to participate rather than less. So, so it's hard to think of stories why, why that would be the case. Uh, so a simpler story that we think is more compelling is, is simply that income could be mismeasured in the SCF. Okay? So you get the classic attenuation error in economics, which is in the SCF as income is mismeasured, it's going to be picked up by something that's correlated with income, but better measured, namely race. But once we measure income more accurately in the tax data, then this attenuation bias goes away and you get a cleaner relationship between income and participation. 
Okay, so that's kind of our preferred story now based on you know, analysis of our data. Now, um, okay. And then the last um, thing we wanted to um, show you was that um, employer retirement plans are an important way in which um, people participate. And in particular, um, access to employer retirement plans could encourage households to participate, right? Because it's a lower cost way to participate than opening an IRA account. Now, the problem is if you run a regression of whether you participate in a retirement account on whether you have access to an employer plan, there's an obvious endogeneity bias, which is that workers uh, in the cross-section have heterogeneous desire for retirement saving. So those that want to save for retirement sort into those employers that actually offer these plans. Okay? So then that's the, uh, that's the bias that you would get in an OLS, OLS regression. So instead we do instrumental variables. And our idea is that we can look at the cross-section of um, in, uh, individuals in 2018 and we can look back to their W-2 in 1999 when they were much younger at between age 31 to 40. And the idea is that uh, we're gonna condition on the subsample of these individuals who did not have an employer retirement plan in 1999, but they had different, but they worked in different sectors. Okay, so some people worked in, let's say finance and insurance and others worked in education and back in 1999. Now, because finance and, uh, and insurance versus education have different prevalence of employer retirement plans, and if you stay in that sector, then over time, you're going to be more exposed to retirement plans if you're in those sectors that have higher prevalence of retirement plans. Okay, so we use the sector of employment in 1999 conditional on whether the employer offered a plan as an instrument for your access to a retirement plan today. So based on this IV specification, we find that among low income households, for each year of access to an employer plan, that increases participation in a plan by nine percentage points. Okay, so that's a pretty big effect. And this big effect is also true for um, um, middle income households in the 20 to 40 and 40 to 60 percentile of income. Now, uh, based on this IV regression, what we do is we do a policy counterfactual, which is suppose we increase access to employer plans by offering it universally. And this is not a, um, a plan that, um, a, a policy counterfactual that we came up with. This is actually state law and now across 10 states. And the uh, intention of this state law is to kind of fill a gap in access to employer retirement plans, especially among uh, smaller employers that have traditionally offered employer plans. So these are the 10 states that are actually um, have this law in place now, inc including um, my home state of New Jersey. So in New Jersey, it's called a secure choice program. And what this does is um, if you um, are an employer that does not offer a plan already, then you have to offer the secure choice program to all your employees. If you are a firm that has at least 25 workers and have been business at least two years. Okay? And once uh, the workers get uh, enrolled into this program, they can opt out. But if they do not opt out, then the, defined con uh, the default contribution rate into this program is 3%. So your 3% of your wage is automatically uh, contributed to this state plan. Okay, so essentially it's making um, you, um, uh, contributions to a retirement plan, a default option, and it's enrolling essentially all workers um, through, through this state law. So we can do this policy counterfactual in our data, which is suppose in the last 10 years, uh, this program were offered to the actual households in our data. So what that actually means is in each year in which uh, these workers were in the in the uh, were were working and received a W two, suppose that we um, assume that they they had access to an employer plan. Okay, so we turn like these dummy variables that are zero if you had no access into ones. Okay, counterfactually assuming that they they had access, then we can compute the predicted change in uh, retirement account participation. 
So among the zero to 20 income group, 41% actually have um, access to retirement plans in the data. Okay, but under this policy counterfactual, that would go up to, uh, for, uh, sorry, 41% have uh, par participate in retirement accounts currently. But under this policy counterfactual, that number would go up to 58%. Okay, so it's like an average treatment effect of 17 percentage points. Okay, so you can actually boost uh, participation in retirement plans by 17 percentage points if you actually make it mandatory that employers offer these plans. Now, you notice that these treatment effects uh, actually diminish as you consider higher income groups. So at the 80 to 100 percentile income group, right, the, the treatment effect is only one percentage point. Why? Well, these guys already participate regardless. 98% of them already do. And they already, moreover, they already have access typically through, through their employer. Okay? So mandating that employers offer these plans has no effect because first, they would participate anyway, and they already have access through their current employer. So kind of the key policy implications of this is that uh, tax incentives that encourage uh, retirement savings at the level of individuals might, might not work so well, because we've been doing that forever and, and uh, retirement uh, plan participation is still low. But offer, uh, uh, encouraging employers to offer these plans might, might have a bigger effect. Okay, so in particular, these mandates for employers to offer retirement plans could, could have a potentially big effect on participation, especially for low-income households. Okay. Right. So what's um, your most likely explanation for this finding? Is it a purely behavioral story, inattention, and that leads to this, or is it... Yeah, so I think it's it's uh it's kind of the um yeah the behavioral story like nudge is if you tell people well you, if you work for a small employer you have to go to Fidelity and open your own IRA mm -hmm. that's a pretty high cost um, and not not only in terms of time but also like kind of the the barriers to doing that is you need to be kind of financially um, literate. Mm -hmm. But instead, suppose the default option is, regardless of which employer you work for in New Jersey, they're automatically gonna take 3% of your payroll and contribute to the state retirement plan. Then unless you kind of fight against that default, then these guys are going to participate. So, so it's just that kind of story, um, yeah, is very, very much important in, in kind of- um, But it's still yeah. the case that many people then actively opt out, no? I mean. That's exactly right. So um, this is not in our paper, but um, there's a paper by Olivia Mitchell and co-authors that look at the Oregon plan. Mm -hmm. And they, they found a, a very high op opt-out rate. And that's actually consistent with like older papers by Bridget Madrigan, uh, Madrigan that you might be um, familiar with in the QJE. She showed that um, lots of workers opt out, uh, but if, um, but over time, like if you um, allow these um, individuals to have access to retirement plans over very like decades, they eventually um, participate. So, so the take up rate is initially low and over a long period of time, it kind of like gradually goes up. So- um, Do you see, do you see some firm effects as well that, you know, if my coworkers opt out, I opt out too, that, you know, we all opt out or I don't opt out. So. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll have to look back at the- But you um, have the data for that, no? Oh, I actually have the data for that in terms of, from the W-2s, I can tell like, yeah, yeah exactly. That's a good idea. So from, from the W-2s, I can say, I can I observe what fraction of workers in your firm opt in, and we can see whether that explains the individual participation rates, yeah. So that, that would be a good idea. I would suspect that, you know, if all my co-workers opt out and they talk about it and work at That's work, right. then opt out too. So it might be bipolar almost. It might also interact with firm size, maybe in, in yeah. somewhat smaller or middle sized firms, then this pure effects might be more important. Yeah. You know? yeah. So those are things that we can definitely test for in our data. We haven't done that, but that's a great idea, Marcus. So, yeah. Okay, um, actually I should mention like kind of the, um, because we're on this topic, uh, there, there are studies of retirement plans that are very influential, but 
if you look at those studies, they're about a single employer. Typically, the data is like a single employer. Uh, and it doesn't allow you to look at whether these individuals had retirement accounts from previous jobs and so on, or whether they have IRAs and, and so on. So, so that's the advantage of tax data is you're able to like really look at individuals or households and look at their comprehensive financial plan, not just at a single firm, but the entire history of firms as well as their individual retirement uh, arrangements and so on. Do you exploit the regional data here as well? And does it matter whether I'm in a red or blue state or region? Um, we haven't done that. So yeah, we can try to test for um, group effects or peer effects. So yeah. suppose I throw in as a specification like the participation rate in the Princeton area. Mm -hmm. Does that explain individual participation in Princeton? That would be like a good way to test for yeah, peer effects. So we haven't done that at all, but that's definitely something that the data allows us to do. Very good. Um, I don't know how much time we're, we have left. We are, we are running over time already. Oh, okay, so let me stop here. Perhaps you want to summarize, perhaps you can come back to the poll uh, and say what surprised you the most by the participants, or do, do you agree with them what uh, they predicted? Um, I'm, ver I'm very much encouraged by this particular audience um, indicated that um, they think it's a good idea for employers to offer a retirement plan. Um, and I was very encouraged by those numbers. So as, as you mentioned, Marcus, two thirds either agree or strongly agree. And um, maybe, unfortunately, um, this is my fault. The, the wording in that question wasn't super clear as one um, someone pointed out in the chat, which is, uh, what does it mean to require employers to offer? That means um, that they don't, employers don't necessarily have to contribute to the plan. Well, all they're doing is giving an opportunity for workers to enroll in a plan. So it doesn't necessarily cost the employers actual money because they're not necessarily matching savings or doing a default contribution from directly from the employer. What I mean by offer is that it, you just give them an, an opportunity to contribute uh, from payroll uh, with an option to opt out. And, and that's what essentially the states are doing. And, and it seems to be um, the, the, actual, the actual policy um, effects from, from such, such plans, uh, it's going to take a while for us to see the actual effects. Because again, like just offering this in one year is not going to uh, boost sa savings or participation immediately. These actually take decades for, for people to start contributing. So, um, so the policies that, that came into effect are, are only in the last few years, but we'll, we'll have to wait another 10 years before we see the full effects, I think. I'm not sure whether we have so much time to wait for another 10 years yeah uh, <laughs> um but let me just okay if you can say one more sentence the fact that the bank uh, participation went down for the well, less well-off people over the last 10 years what's the explanation for that what what's your favorite explanation for that and what policy measure would you do to, to correct for that phenomenon so that's where um a lot of uh, questions that that we get, which right are right on point, and I think you you also mentioned is maybe the reason it's declining is people are finding alternative ways to mm -hmm. make payments. So, like, are there PayPal accounts, Venmo accounts? Um, are there maybe um, Walmart apparently has some um, payment cards that allow you to like. And then essentially, then it doesn't show up in your tax data. So if yeah, you have exactly. a Venmo account so, or PayPal account, yeah. it does not so show up. So this is like substitution into like more informal ways of uh, making payments. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's one one hypothesis. The other one is um, this is like a post financial crisis thing. So in, there are some papers on this topic that we cite in our paper, which is post financial crisis, um, the regulatory environment for banks uh, changed in a way that. It was no longer profitable for banks to offer like free accounts and so on. So some of these fees went up in a way that disadvantaged uh, low income. So one of the kind of the unintended consequences uh, of the post crisis regulatory environment is that it might have made it more costly for low income households to maintain bank accounts. 
And if that's true, then that's kind of a disturbing. And then some paper, papers argue this is true. They, they think that's what's going on. And if that's true, that's kind of a disturbing con unintended consequence of the crisis. So, and, and if so, we need, we need policy interventions to fix so in that. In some countries, so I don't know how in the US, it is required for a bank to offer some basic bank account at a low fee. There's no such law in the United States, or is there? Uh, no, no. That's that's another yeah you know, potential policy um implication is to right uh do a price control on fees for for low account balances yeah um can I actually spend one minute just um, showing you one one last thing uh, that I wanted to and this touches upon your um point about um fintech so. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah, so this, you can get to this for my website um, mm -hmm. under research, household finance, financial inclusion, and then bank accounts, retirement account. We created these maps. Uh, so this is for bank accounts and this is for retirement accounts. Okay, so what this map allows me to do is I can like go to a zip code, like 08540, Princeton, New Jersey which is actually um, among low income, um, participation in retirement accounts uh, is low in Princeton. And it's actually higher in West Windsor and Hopewell. And we can keep zooming out and we can see like what's going on in, in New Jersey. Uh, of course, we have these very deep red areas in Trenton near Elizabeth and New York and so on. So the reason I, um, I think this map could be uh, important is this is like an opportunity for fintech firms to kind of try to target these regions that are, that are red. Because fintech could be like, could could go in two directions. One is maybe they're just cream skimming off of the existing customers who would bank with traditional banks anyway. The alternative view is that they're expanding the financial services to uh, people who traditionally didn't have access to these services. Okay, so if it's the latter, then this type of map would be like very powerful in the sense that, okay, if I wanna do uh, a good thing, which is allow low income households to open retirement accounts or bank accounts, then this map tells you exactly where those interventions are gonna be most, most effective. So I think that this type of map is a powerful tool for both governments and FinTech firms to um, try to boost participation and, and target those regions where participation's um, currently low. All right. Very good. So, but if so, it's always the case, like in Princeton, it's a high income area, but that's where the poor people are particularly badly banked. So, it, that exactly. shows again that there's a high density of bank branches, I guess, in Princeton. Yeah. It exactly. didn't help them, the poor people, because no, I don't know for what reason. Uh, I think the, the idea behind fintech firms is like maybe traditional banks are too, um, too hard to use because of the fees and maybe the rigid structure of, of a bank. But maybe FinTech firms are more nimble, like you, you, all you need is a phone and, and very little. Um, doesn't take a lot to maybe open account, account maintenance fees are lower. Maybe they're able to reach these households. Maybe that's, that's kind of one view. And if that's true, we're, we're hoping that this type of tool could, could help those FinTech firms do what they're intending to do um, in, in a much more targeted way. Very good. I think that is, is opening a business model for a fintech company to really <laughs> do something good for society and hopefully somebody will pick it up. And um, thanks a lot, Moto. Um, this was very fascinating and insightful and a fast, fascinating data set on top of it with, I guess, with 360 million data points. And um, let me just do some little advertising. In two weeks, we will have Alan Blinder uh, uh, presenting an out about soft and hard landing from the 1960s to uh, the 2020s. So we will learn you know, when the Fed was able to orchestra a soft landing and when it was not able to orchestra a, so a soft landing. And he, it's based on a book he's writing following Anna Schwartz and uh, Milton Friedman's book about the history of the, the Fed. He's essentially continuing that from the 1960s onwards 
and based on this proxy will present in two weeks about soft and hard landing. So I hope that all of you will come again in two weeks. It will be a Friday instead of a Thursday. And uh, I thank you to all of you for participating and hope to see you soon again. And particularly, thank you to Moto for his fantastic presentation. Bye-bye.